I'm joined today by Dr. Stephen Novella. Dr. Novella is a faculty neurologist here at the Yale School of Medicine, but he's perhaps best known as the host of Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, one of the, if not the most popular science podcasts out there right now. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for joining me on Dr. Doc. Thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun. Now, you're, uh, you're the editor of a blog called Science-Based Medicine. I wanted to start there. What's science-based medicine? How's that different than evidence-based medicine, which we've all yeah. been told we need to practice. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, obviously, evidence-based medicine is fantastic. It's good. As we say, it's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough, and it, it gets a couple of things, I think, importantly wrong. And I think we know a lot in the last, you know, 10 or so years when we looked at the literature, we realized that, you know, you can't just look at clinical trials and, and answer questions about what treatments are likely to work or what the net effect of a medical intervention. You have to look at all the science. You have to look at you know, prior plausibility as well. Uh, in fact, we know now rigorously that you can't really interpret clinical trials unless you know the overall scientific plausibility of the hypothesis that you're testing. So science-based medicine, in short, considers all of the scientific evidence completely and doesn't focus narrowly on just the clinical evidence and throwing out we, in our opinion, they tend to throw out prior plausibility. So, for example, like a Cochrane review will look at a highly implausible therapy with completely mediocre results and say, oh, this is interesting and should be studied. It's like, no, it's actually not interesting. Hmm. And the evidence is completely consistent with the null hypothesis. And no, it shouldn't be studied any further. It's been studied more than enough to reject this highly implausible you know, hypothesis to begin with. So we come to very different conclusions looking at the same data when you consider all the evidence versus put blinders on almost deliberately and just focus on clinical trials. So uh, the the scientific method here is is central, right? We, we're building upon prior evidence, biological plausibility, uh, in some cases even chemical or physical plausibility if you're talking about something like homeopathy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, in your experience over the past, let's say, 30 years, how's the public's attitude towards science and towards scientists changed? Is it doom and gloom? It's not doom and gloom. I mean, so science, science and scientists are still highly regarded in society in general. People tend to cherry pick. They tend to choose which science they want to believe. Mm -hmm. um, they don't necessarily reject all of science just because there's one piece of it. But I do think that this, the public has been deliberately confused about what is the consensus of scientific opinion and what qualifies as good science. Uh, there have been deliberate campaigns of doubt and confusion, as we say, right? I mean, the, the classic example is, of course, the tobacco industry mm -hmm. that did a, a very good job of, of sowing doubt and confusion about the, uh, the health risks of smoking. And that model has just you know, metastasized, and now we see it with regard to all sorts of things. Uh, interestingly, within medicine, I think the most interesting phenomenon has been the rebranding of what 50 years ago was universally known as health fraud to an alternative to medicine. This is now, all, what used to be fraud is now alternative, and in order to make that sale, they, they in a large way, um, turned science on its head. They said, no, we're going to use science differently. We're going to use different standards of evidence. We're going to use pragmatic studies as if they were efficacy trials, and et cetera. We're going to ignore prior plausibility or scientific plausibility, uh, and it's all good. You know, we're going to have this Western medicine dichotomy that doesn't really exist and pretend like some things can't be studied except in the ways we want them to be studied because those are the ones that give the results that we like. So it's been a, you know, an, an amazing deliberate campaign to confuse how we know stuff in medicine mm. in order to allow in this really low standard of evidence because these are treatments that don't do well when you hold them to rigorous standards. So this brings us to our patients. Um, mm. So you're a practicing neurologist. You see patients clinically right. all the time. Um, do you see patients that hold non-scientific beliefs? I assume you must, and, and yeah. how do you interact with them? Yeah, every day. You know, so it's a very, very common occurrence. Patients sometimes just ask their curious, hey, should I try this? You know, should I try acupuncture for my migraines? You mm -hmm. know, I've heard good things. Or they tell me, oh, I'm, I'm taking this supplement. Is this, they may just tell it to me, asking me about it, or they may just in, be informing me that they're taking this supplement. And, you know, in Connecticut, unfortunately, naturopaths are common, and a lot of patients will tell me, yeah, I saw a naturopath, and they prescribed this, you know, homeopathic remedy for me. Mm. Um, and sometimes, like, a very, very common story that I hear is, yeah, I saw 
two or three physicians, I think I have Lyme disease. Mm. And my physicians say I don't have Lyme disease because my tests are negative and I don't meet the criteria, whatever. But I, but I looked up the symptoms on Google and I have all the symptoms. Mm. So then I went to a naturopath and he did a lot of tests for me and he says I do have Lyme disease and he gave me this homeopathic remedy for it. Mm. So this is unfortunately a common occurrence. So, you know, obviously we have to form a therapeutic relationship with our patients and you can't be judgmental towards them. So we, it's a very... Um, challenging framework in which to confront these issues. But I think a, f a few things. One, if a patient's in my office, they're there to get my professional advice, and they are already acknowledging by their very presence that they have some respect for science-based medicine, for evidence-based medicine. Um, and I do think that they expect that I'm going to give them my honest opinion. And so I give it. I say, listen, I looked at the research on this, and in fact, I do not think that this is a a, a valid treatment. I don't think that this is going to be effective, or I don't think that you have Lyme disease for these these reasons. They generally appreciate the fact that I took the time to actually look at the literature, even though it may be more of a fringe treatment and not something you know that physicians are, are giving. Um, and they appreciate that I take the time to explain to them why I feel the way that I do. I don't pull my punches, but I say just very non-judgmentally, these are the facts. This is my interpretation of the evidence or here's the standard recommendation of the relevant, you know, professional society. This is why we think, and you know, you also have to gauge, like, what's the patient really thinking? You can't just lecture them. You have to sort of interact with them. Sometimes they have misconceptions that are pretty easy to fix. Um, so, you know, it takes, you have to invest the time to understand the narrative, understand what the patient's thinking, understand what they want, address the information that they're being given. So, yeah, you know, we live in a time where we have to spend a lot of our time, I think, undoing a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. uh, that's being fed to our patients, but it's absolutely worth it. And, you know, the, the effect uh, can be, you know, definitely worth the time that you're investing because you think about it, you can have the best plan for your patient that's all science-based and has, you know, class one cl double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials, but if they don't believe it because they were told something else, mm -hmm. you know, by their naturopath or whatever, it doesn't matter. You have to get them to buy into, the, right. you know, how to approach, you know, uh, the, the, the therapeutic you know, strategy that you're going to be taking. Patients do share you know, with us, we all want to use what works, right? We want to know what works and what is safe. We all have that same goal. And, you know, you should have a pretty sophisticated understanding, I think, as a practitioner of how we know what works and how we decide what, what is above the waterline in terms of using it. And you should get the patient to understand that at least to, to enough that they're going to buy into your to your treatment recommendations. And how often do you think this is successful? Um, what's your, it's not going to always be successful. Yeah. How many patients do you think you sit down, you talk to them, say, you know what? Okay, I'm I'm going to go with the 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 the, the treatment that has some science behind it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't have numbers for yeah. you because it's uh, you would have to like really it'd be hard to study that. Yeah. But uh, obviously, like patients don't come back to me. I don't know if they don't yeah. come back because they got better or if they didn't come back because they decided I, I didn't they didn't want to do what I said. Mm -hmm. Um, I can only tell you about the patients who do come back and, and what happens. And my experience is generally positive, at least again with those selective patients. They, uh, again, they appreciate the time that I, the, the fact that I spent time to explaining to them and they, and you can usually make them understand, you know, why at least I have the opinion that I do. And yeah, patients generally listen to, you know, to what I have to say. Um, again, highly selective in terms of who yeah. comes to me in the first place and who decides to, to, to stick with it. But it's, I mean, I've never had a patient get angry with me or storm out or anything like that. I've never had any of those dramatic negative experiences. Um, and, of course, we all struggle with compliance. Like getting, it's hard yeah. often to get patients to do what you need any to patient. do. Or want, any <laughs> patient. In any context, it's hard. It, it's, uh, compliance is difficult. Uh, but it's been successful for me, you know, dealing with patients, and the feedback has been generally very positive. So a challenge for physicians uh, is when a, a patient – um, asks you about one of these therapies that you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, this happens. You know, okay, I, I've heard of acupuncture. I sort yeah. of know some literature there. Uh, you know, someone comes in and asks me about reflexology or yeah. something that really, you know, I have not looked into this. What are the resources available to physicians? Because if I Google this, I'm going to get into a world of trouble. So mm -hmm. what resources do physicians have to find out, you know, what 
what is the evidence if there is any? So we yeah. can do that due diligence because we'd all love yeah, yeah. to tell our patients, yeah, you know what? I read up on this. Yeah. 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 yeah that happens a lot too. Patients ask because there's so many things out there, right. so many specific things. I can't, you know, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of yeah. every supplement out there. Uh, so patients ask me about things that I am only vaguely familiar with or I just flat out never heard of before. I'll say, oh, that's, I've never heard of that particular treatment before. I might give them some general advice about that type of treatment. I say, mm-hmm. I'm usually a little cautious about supplements because the industry isn't very well regulated. Mm-hmm. So you can give some general advice. But I'll look at that specific one for you and let you know what I find. Um, and sometimes you find interesting things. Like I've had patients you know, with taking supplements that had lots of stimulants in them that they weren't aware of and they were getting palpitations and whatnot. So sometimes you, know, you can give them very specific factual information that's helpful. Or um, you could say, listen, there's, it's, it hasn't been studied. We essentially know nothing about this. And I, this is why I don't recommend you try it in, you know, for, for these various reasons. Um, or you know, maybe it has been studied. Uh, like you know, like acupuncture, for example, ones that are or lo- lots of homeopathic remedies have been studied. Lots of the electrical stimulation have been tried for a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. There is often a literature out there on these things, and you can find them in PubMed. You could find. I think I wouldn't shy away from Google. You just got to know how to search yep. to find the good stuff. Um, obviously, there are some academic sites, and there are some sites like Science Based Medicine. That's part of what we try to do is just to do. Uh, thorough evaluations of the more fringe stuff so that when a practitioner does search on something weird, maybe it'll come up on science-based medicine. They'll have at least somebody who looked into it and tried to analyze it from a scientific point of view. So it may take a little bit uh, more legwork, you know, to find the information, but it's there. It's often there. Uh, you probably should develop the skill and the familiarity to to quickly assess it. The good news is there often isn't a thousand studies of these things. Usually right. it's like there's five or ten, and you could pretty quickly say, oh, good, there's a systematic review, and it shows that it doesn't work. Okay, mm-hmm. good. I, I, I did my due diligence. I know this this doesn't work. You know, like I suspected it didn't because the plausibility is incredibly low. Um, so, but again, a little bit of investment goes a long way. And then once you, once you do that on a regular basis, of course, you then become very familiar with all the most common things that patients are going to ask you. So you, you have to do less and less of it to keep up. Where is the intersection between skepticism and the medical establishment? Um, where is it now? Where would you like it to be uh, in the next 10, 20 years? So, I mean, I think, so skepticism basically is just a, a pl- rigorously applying critical thinking, metacognition, understanding science and pseudoscience to the kinds of questions that we confront in our everyday lives. Medicine, obviously, and healthcare in general is, is, is part of that. It's, I think there's no distinction between those things. It's just one aspect of, of what skepticism is. Um, in terms of institutionally, uh, it definitely, I think, needs to be integrated a lot more. I mean, we're trying to promote that as much as we can through science-based medicine. I think uh, in the UK, they're a little bit ahead of us in that they actually, multiple universities have like professorships of the public understanding of science, mm-hmm. and that seems to work really well. I'm not familiar with any such you know, academic positions in the United States, but I'd love to, to start to see things like that. You know, universities take very seriously the need to popularize and promote the public understanding of science in general and medicine in particular. I think, you know, if the, if the academic infrastructure isn't going to try to educate our patients just, you know, society-wide about the nature of the relationship between science and medicine, then we are going to lose to the people who are trying to miseducate the public about that because they have billions of dollars on the line, right? Mm-hmm. They have something to sell, mm-hmm. and it's in, it's in their financial interest to misinform patients about the nature of placebo, the nature of evidence. Um, you know, all these things about, about the nature of the institutions of medicine. I mean, you know, they're, they're you know, telling a, a very unflattering narrative about mainstream medicine, creating all of these false narratives and false dichotomies. So I don't think we can bury our head in the sand and just ignore it. I think that we need to, to engage. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, people out there who are trying to engage, but I see it mostly on an individual level and not on an institutional level. Um, and I'm just starting to see some movement where they recognize, yeah, we're living in the world with social media and you know, and non-traditional ways of communicating. And we have to incorporate this or we're going to become, you know, a fossil. You know, it's going to be, we're going to be rendered irrelevant if we don't get with the times. Well, Dr. Stephen Avella, thank you for engaging with us today. Um, and, and hopefully when that endowed chair for the public, uh, <laughs> public education and science is here at Yale, you can be the first, uh, the first I wasn't chair. making a point, but yeah, I won't say no. Yeah. Okay, right. thank you very much. Thank you.